Well, hi, everyone. I am back today for the second time with Coach Jen, and I am so excited to be with you. And as we always do, we would love for you to give us a shout out to let us know that our technology has succeeded once again, that we have somehow gone from Canada and Arizona to the sound waves and stream yard of the world and are able to be on YouTube and Facebook for wherever you are. So if you are here with us live, if you could just give us a shout out on my public Facebook page and just say, hello, we are here, that would really encourage me because then I will get started with our content. If you can let us know, so far I don't see anyone, so I'm going to not get started with anything that we're gonna talk about that's important. And we have got an important topic today. But let us know that you are here with us. Ah, there you are, yay, good, good, good. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome everyone, welcome. Hi, thank you for telling us that you're here. Hello from Nebraska and California. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Jen and I were just having this conversation. Do you see this? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm a wannabe painter and I'm taking painting classes and I always go through this really ugly stage. So this little old lady is the first time I'm trying to paint an old woman with really old wrinkles in her face. So she's kind of in her ugly stage right now, but she's gonna have this really wry smile that says, I got here <laughs> and I'm good. And so I just want you to know that God is going to get you there and you're going to be good, but you might go through some ugly stages just like she's going through right now. And so I thought I'll just leave her here right now because she looks kind of scary. My husband said, you really want her out there. She looks kind of like a monster, but she doesn't really look that way. I think she looks amazing. And I picked up on the smile and I kind of gave, she gave me a bit of a shudder. Yeah. She's got a little <laughs> sass yeah. to her. So anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here to talk about is it possible for you to have a relationship with someone who is a liar? And I'm going to say it that strong because the truth is all of us can lie. Mm -hmm. All of us have the propensity to see. I remember when I was babysitting for my granddaughter, Jen, and she was, I mean, she just started to talk. She wasn't two, you know, two and a half maybe. And I was babysitting for her. And she was climbing up on her daddy's computer chair to play with his computer. And she already knew that was wrong and her parents weren't there. So she was doing that. And I said, Maya, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And she goes, I didn't know, I didn't know. So she lied to me right there. She knew, she knew. And I didn't teach her to lie. Her parents didn't teach her to lie. The Bible says it's right inside of us that we have a tendency when we get caught red handed with something, we're gonna lie our way out of it. So all of us have that in us. Nobody had to teach us. It comes quite naturally. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. The Bible tells us in Psalm, it says, um, show me, O Lord, if I have any wicked way in me. Show me my deceit. And remember this morning and yesterday and the day before we talked about the importance. If you want to be mature, that you need self-awareness, that you know you're lying that you know that you're not telling the truth or you're not facing the truth because the truth is important. The truth is important. So we're not talking about someone who has lied to you because that happens. We're talking about, can you have a relationship with a liar? How would you discern that difference between someone who has lied and someone who is a liar? Yeah, I'd like to hear what, the, what our viewers have to say about that because I think sometimes uh, the discernment piece is, is that's a whole other topic where we learn how to listen to what our gut says, which I think is the Holy Spirit speaking to us because Leslie, you've taught us so well about all the different messaging systems we have, right? We have our thoughts, we have our emotions, but then there's this intuition. And sometimes you could just tell, even like with your granddaughter's example or just a stranger, you can just tell something's off. Mm -hmm. This isn't right. So even in an adult form, you can tell that they're just not telling the truth. And I think that, you know, and then we question ourselves because there isn't hard evidence. And I think there's sometimes we don't give our intuition, which, like I said, I think is the Holy Spirit enough credit when we're faced with those weird sort of spidey sense tinglings that are telling us something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really important that you bring that up because sometimes we don't have hard, hard evidence but we do have a history, a pattern of former lies 
And so once trust has been broken, that antenna is even more strong, you know, even with your children. When your teenagers tell you lies, uh, it's hard to have a trusting relationship with them. You don't want to let them have the car. You don't want to give them privileges and responsibilities because you don't trust them. It's hard to have a good relationship with someone who you can't trust to tell you the truth. And once that trust has been broken, even with your own children, they have to rebuild that trust in order for you to give them access to your resources, whether it's your money, your car, um, your credit card, whatever it might be that they've misused or lied about, you're not going to just freely hand that over again. So why is it so hard for wives and even Christian counselors and pastors to understand that when you've lived with a liar, when someone who's chronically lied to you about whether it's an addiction or whether it's um, you know, lying to you about how they've spent money or where they've spent money or lying to you about their feelings or lying to you about whose fault is what, whatever it is that they're lying about. Uh, why is it so hard for pastors to understand and counselors to understand? It's not possible to have a good relationship with someone like that. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. It's like building a foundation on sand we know that that's not going to hold us up for any length of time at all because those fibs can just be cracked wide open at a moment's notice. So yeah. I think it's really, it's, it's that belief behaviors when there's been a pattern, like some people are saying in the comments, when there's been a habit or it's been repeated, you know, that's when you know. But if you don't have that history and you're just coming into it, that can be where intuition can serve you well. Yeah. And I think when you catch someone in a lie or you confront them, hey, I don't think you're telling me the truth right now, whether again, it's your husband or a child or a friend, you know, that may be true. That may be true that someone has lied because they got scared or they felt shame or whatever it was. And when you call them on it, do they own it? You know, you're right. I, I am scared and I should have told you the truth, but I didn't. Can they come clean? Can they own their stuff? Or do they make more lies about those lies? And that's what we would call more of a liar, someone who cannot own their stuff even when confronted, that they will gaslight you, they will spin the story, they will tell you just as much truth to get you off their back to make you think, oh, okay, but there's a whole lot more that you don't know that they haven't told you that you found out. And I'm just gonna read you a couple verses um, because I think this is so important for Christians because I think sometimes we have been taught falsely that if we forgive someone, that that relationship should be instantly restored. And when you're living with someone who lies to you, that is not possible. And I'm going to be doing a whole entire workshop in two weeks, two weeks actually from tomorrow, um, April 13th. It's going to be at noon Eastern time or 730 this time. It's going to be live. It's going to be a workshop. You're going to get a workbook. We're going to have a whole hour together of me teaching you how to answer this question. How long should you keep trying? How long should you keep trying? And if you are trying, how will you know that the changes that are happening are real? So the question is, how long should you keep trying at this relationship, mostly for you marriage, those of you who are listening? And if there is change, if you're seeing change, and you might be seeing some change, how will you know those changes are from the heart real changes or are they whitewash image management? just telling you what you want to hear so that you get off their back or so that you restore privileges. And so that's the, 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 the conversation that I want to have with you in two weeks. And so if that's you, if you're married to a liar or if you're living with a person who regularly lies to you, it's not possible to have a good relationship with them. Now, if you're married to them, that's really hard because you're bound by law to them and you're also accountable and responsible for some of the decisions they make, even when they're lying with money or taxes or all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for, you know, I just talked to a woman yesterday who said she was pregnant with her fourth child and the doctor had to give her the bad news that she also had a sexually transmitted disease. Your husband's lying to you. He's saying he's faithful. He's not faithful. And the evidence is in your body, right? And he's still lying. I don't know where you got that. You must've been fooling around. You know, crazy making kinds of things. 
And so it's so important that you understand what God has to say about this. So Jen, you probably have a couple of verses too, but let me just share a couple of verses that what God says lying is about. And I'm going to actually take my Bible and I'm going to open it and read it. And I'm going to tell you where the verses are. First of all, in the Ten Commandments, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Because why? It hurts people. It hurts your relationship. It's wrong. It harms people. So let me just read a couple of verses. Um, let's just read what God hates, first of all. Because did you know that God hates lying? He hates it. So we think only God hates adultery or God hates, you know, murder or something. But God hates lying. It says this. There are six things the Lord hates in Proverbs 6, verses 17. Haughty eyes. Do you live with someone with haughty eyes? Or do you have them? A lying tongue. Second thing, pride, deceit. God hates. Hands that kill the innocent. A heart that plots evil. Feet that race to do wrong. Here it is again. A false witness who pours out lies. Mm -hmm. and a person who sows discord in a family. And how else do you sow discord in a family? By gaslighting, distorting the truth, making up falsehoods, telling falsehoods about other people. God hates that. Let me read another one talking about the damage that lying does. This is God's word. Proverbs 25, 18. Telling lies about other people is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. God's word is saying this is serious. This is damaging to you. It is damaging to your relationships. God hates a lying tongue, it says. In Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, put off falsehood. Tell the truth to one another. In Matthew 15, let me just look to that. There's a bunch of them. So you can look up lying in the Bible. I mean, in Google, just go Google. What does the Bible say about lying? It'll <laughs> give you a bunch of verses. I want you to know that God hates it. It's not good for a relationship. It hurts you. It hurts the relationship. It hurts and damages the integrity of the other person. There is nothing good about lying. Matthew 15, 18 through 20 says this. Don't you understand? Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words that you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. So when your husband blames you for his lying, for his adultery, for his theft, for his evil thoughts, we had a Facebook Live this morning about the blame game and when someone blames you or you blame yourself. The Bible is saying, hey, that's not true. It comes from you. It comes from your heart. If you're lying or someone's lying to you, it's not because you're too sensitive. It's not because you can't handle it. It's because someone's heart is geared that way. You have any other verses, Jen, that you have? Near? Yeah. Um, well, the one that, that, is, encur is meant, I believe, for encouragement, but then this is also speaks to when we are living with a liar, the dangers that can come up. Because in Luke um, 8, 17, it says, for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. So in other words, we always think about these lies will eventually be, they'll, they'll be outed. And that's that's the encouraging part is that we know that the truth will be revealed at some point but my concern is then when we are living with a liar is how and when and when it does come out what is going to happen 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And someone said in the chat, withholding the truth is the same thing. So passive lying by mm -hmm. not telling is the same as telling a falsehood, right? By not telling the whole truth about the story, you don't get the whole facts of the story, right? So he might have stopped at the hardware store on the way home, but he also stopped at the porn shop or the bar or the prostitute's house as well. But he didn't tell you that part. But the reason he's late is he stopped at Target, Target or Ace Hardware. And he might have told you that part, but he didn't tell you the rest. That's still considered a lie. That's and one more verse that I'd like to share is in uh, John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies and that all of lies originate from there. And so you need to understand how evil this is and how damaging it is to relationships. God wants you to have healthy relationships. He wants you to have safe, trusting, loving relationships. And that's why we're here, because we want that for you too. But you need to discern when that's not possible with someone because they won't be truthful with themselves they won't be truthful with you about what's going on inside of them as well as what they've done that may have harmed you or the relationship. Yeah, I'm feeling really um, convicted right now. Not, not in the sense that I've been lying and I have something to confess, but just how powerful your words, what you're sharing today. I mean, I think I've probably even forgiven less than white lies before, but not realizing how they penetrate, how deeply they can wound and, and how if you let them seep in, even the more innocent type ones, they could probably fester and grow into something else. Or it teaches me that if that person lied and I was okay with it, well, then maybe I can do that. And I spread it around. It's not sitting very well with me right now. And I thank you for that. It's a good mm -hmm. message to hear that it's very unsettling. Yeah, it is. And it's very damaging. And, and I just want to, I've said this before, but we have new people each time we have a Facebook Live. Rebecca said, my spouse lost over $100,000 gambling. I am the sole provider. So I've begun to stash money in a savings for safety reasons, but that means I'm being deceiving also. That's a really something to think about, Rebecca, and what would be different. There's a blog that I just answered today. Maybe it was yours. I don't know about a husband who got into huge gambling debt and he wants to rebuild trust. And what does that look like? So you might want to go to my blog today because I answered that question. Uh, LeslieBurnett.com forward slash blog. And it's you know, a blog that you can participate in and answer. How do you rebuild broken trust when someone has done that? And I don't think you have to deceive him again. I think you can need to say, hey, I don't trust you. You are irresponsible with money. I'm willing to, whether you're willing to or not, I think I'm willing to rebuild some broken trust, but I'm not giving you access to the money because you have, you have broken my trust. So I don't think you need to lie to him about it. I think you just need to say, this is what I'm willing to do and this is what I'm not willing to do. Mm -hmm. And if he really is repentant and wants to rebuild your trust, if I were in issues, I'd be saying, I get it. <laughs> I totally get it. You're you're free. I remember working with a woman who had bipolar and she, in, a, in a bipolar manic episode, she took all of their money and gambled it away. All of their like 401 money and everything that was in there, uh, you know, in a manic, you know, even though she was mentally ill, when she came to her senses, her husband cut her off of the accounts, cut her off of the credit cards and said, until your illness is stabilized, and until we have a, a safety plan in place for if you get that way again, I'm not giving you any access to the money. And she said, good, I don't want to, you know, I don't want access to the money because I was totally out of my mind. Right. And so when you're truly repentant, you understand that there are consequences for what you've done and you're not bucking the consequences. And if you are bucking the consequences, then you're not truly repentant. Mm -hmm. That somehow you think you should get a get out of jail free card because you're a Christian. And your in grace means I don't have to experience any consequences. But friend, if you if you drive home drunk, you could be truly repentant. But if you do something damaging or you get caught, you're still paying the penalty. And the Bible tells us what you sow, you reap. And so, Rebecca, for you, I would think that you're, the proof of the pudding is you have two choices. Either we work to reconcile broken trust, and that means you don't get access to the money until I see that you have a different habit in your addiction. Or... We don't reconcile this marriage, but I'm not going to become a liar just to protect my money. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's a different approach to protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's so wise because we don't want to fall trapped to things that have been. So when we've been deceived, we don't want to start using those same tools, even understandably so for our own protection. We don't want to do that because I have lots of women, as you know, when I when I'm working with partners or, and wives of um, sexual and porn addicted people, um, there's a lot of spying that goes on. And I've talked to those women about that, because if you don't like the secrets that your husband has been keeping from you about his secret life, how do you feel about keeping secret things on his phone, these apps, these monitoring things, listening devices, stuff like that without him knowing? There's lots of couples out there that will share those things and say, yes, by all means, you can know exactly where I am all the time. And there, there's complete transparency. But I think we have to be careful about taking on that, that lying or deceit as a tool, even for our own protection. Yeah. And I, I think that one exception I would make to that is if your husband has been violent toward you mm. and you are afraid for your physical safety, you're not about to tell him, hey, I'm calling the domestic violence shelter tomorrow or I'm con contacting an attorney to file a PFO. You're not going to tell him that because you're putting yourself in physical danger, just like, you know, Joseph's not going to tell Pharaoh where Jesus is or the wise men didn't tell jo uh, the, the, the Pharaoh, yeah, not Pharaoh, but Herod, where the why, uh, baby Jesus was, they didn't tell him because it was dangerous and it would have caused harm to someone. And so I think those are, those are places just like if I were, here's where we have to think about values. What's most important to God telling the truth. And it is important to God to tell the truth. This is what we're talking about. So we don't want to get sidetracked on this, but Rahab in the old Testament was a prostitute and she lied to keep the Jewish spies, the 10 spies who were hiding in her house of prostitution safe from the people of the town that were looking to kill him, kill them. And she said they went that way when really they were that way when she was hiding them. And Rahab was commended. If, if we have a time in our country where certain people are being killed and just like there was in Germany with World War II or Europe where you had to hide Jews or you didn't have to, but you could. And they came to your door and asked if you had any Jews here, you're not gonna say, well, I cannot tell a lie. Yes, they're hiding in the basement. You're going to tell a lie because their safety is more important in those moments. But I think that we're not talking about those kind of danger situations. But if you're in that kind of, don't get a pang of conscience and say, you've got to tell well, the truth in those instances. I'm, I think not, to say that. That. I'm not telling the truth. Absolutely. Right? We always care about safety first here, physical safety first. Mm -hmm. But I do want to comment on what you're saying, because if someone is, if someone has betrayed you sexually or financially or other ways, and they have lied to you about their gambling addiction or their sexual addiction or their, you know, alcohol addiction or drug addiction, whatever. Part of the restoration process, if they are going to be restored to a relationship with you, is their willingness to be honest and accountable. So if they're not willing to. So if you said to them something like, hey, I, I need some assurance that you are where you say you're going to be, or you doing what you say you're going to do. So I want access to our financial records at all times. I want to be able to check our accounts. I want access to where you are on our, whatever those apps are, so that if I feel anxious, I can just check. I want to be able to look at your phone whenever I ask without any attitude. You can say that, you can't demand that, and please don't sneak it. But if you say, this is what I need to feel like we're on a track of rebuilding trust mm -hmm. and they give you pushback and they won't do it, that tells you something. It yeah. gives you a whole lot of information for you to make a good choice. And that is, you can't trust them, right? Because they're not willing to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. <laughs> That's for sure. And it's it's heartbreaking, but you can actually that's where we were saying earlier, sometimes we don't have hard evidence and that might not feel like hard evidence to somebody because they didn't actually get to see the phone, for example, as you said. But the fact that they won't hand over their phone to you, that's the evidence. That's the that's the behavioral truth that's coming out right now, the, their mm -hmm. attitude towards it. And that's what you need to know. That's when there's deceit, there's lying by omission. I'm not going to show you my phone. <laughs> yeah. Andrea asks, I'm married to an alcoholic. I understand all addicts, alcoholics, including lie continually because alcohol is more important to them than anything. 
I have reconciled to just not ask him any questions that I know he will lie about. Like, have you been drinking? Okay. He does not lie about other areas of our life. Any suggestions? I think you have to decide what you can live with and what you can't live with. And mm -hmm. if he is uh, not being damaging to you while he's drinking, let's say he's sitting there watching movies and he's just leaving you alone and he's drinking away and it, you can afford the money he's spending on alcohol and it's not hurting your children for, to see that or it's not he's not causing, you know, he's not being belligerent and violent and mean or abusive during that time. Um, I think there are things that we can forbear one another's weaknesses, whatever they might be. And some of them might be some serious weaknesses um, as long as they're not causing. So I think you have to ask yourself, what is the impact of this on us? Mm -hmm. And can we live with that impact in a reasonably peaceful way? And if we can't, because he is violent, he is draining our accounts. He is, you know, mean and ugly and violent when he drinks too much, then <laughs> it's not just about the lying. It's about what the addiction is doing to him and, and to you. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't sure, Monica, what your comment was. I was praying and studying scripture. That's why I couldn't do what you asked. You shouldn't squelch the Holy Spirit. Could you explain that a little bit more? Not sure what that means. How do you trust someone with an addiction, Jen, when they can go a long time without it, but eventually fall back? You've had that experience. And that yeah, is yeah. falling back and trusting someone with an addiction. How do you do that? You Well, really, you trust yourself. You trust in the Lord. Um, Leslie, you and I always mess this up, but we love that bird. On I, the know. <laughs> I know. I know. As soon as you looked at me, I'm like, ah, it's the, we, tr we trust what is it? We don't trust the branch that we're, okay, basically everyone listening, you don't trust the branch you're standing on because you trust the strength of the wings that you have to fly, right? So something like that. Yeah, so that, so that picture I want you to picture is a bird on a tree. And so you're a bird on a tree and the issue is you don't trust that the branch will never break. Thank you. You trust that if it starts to break, your wings are strong enough to yeah. fly away. That's right. And so the goal, if you're going to choose to stay with someone who struggles with an addiction, is that you do your own work so that if they have re relapse, you're not dependent on them, that you are strong enough to let them go and make their choices and live in the, in the pigsty. If they're going to live in the pigsty, like the prodigal son, let his son go and do what he was going to do. And you're strong enough to be able to support yourself, to be able to support your family, to be able to take care of yourself. And we're just not talking about financially, but we're talking about emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. mentally. And so your work in living with an addict, that's why they have Alanon, is for you to not spend all your energy trying to fix and save him and change him. Your work is to do your own work so that if the branch breaks, your wings are strong. You're not going down with him. That's right. Absolutely. So trust in the Lord, trust in yourself. And just like when, when we were commenting earlier about the gambling situation um, and putting money aside, that's part of that trust. It's like, I'm not going to be caught like that again. I'm not going to hang on the fact that my husband lost $100,000 of ours. I'm going to put money aside now. So it's those types of things that we have to do to be protective in a transparent sort of way. Yeah. And Sandy's asking, I moved out three months ago and went to counseling for the first time this week with him. I was shocked and sickened at how easily the falsehoods came out of his mouth. How do I proceed? Any recommendations? Oh, that's so hard because I can picture, I'm just, my heart goes out to you as I'm thinking, picturing in that counseling office and you're just, you're almost shocked, gobsmacked by the fact that these lies are coming out of his mouth and you don't want to get defensive and start creating this tug of war almost. It becomes a he said, she said. Um, so in that case, I mean, you could try to say something and ask if it's appropriate for you to speak and not come off as a defensive type of person, but I would ultimately find someone that I can trust someone that will hear my heart and will understand what it is that I'm dealing with, because I know what my truth is and I need to find someone that might be able to validate and, and hear me. Mm -hmm. I would say that this is good information for you. So if you're going to counseling and your husband's saying, I'm willing to go to counseling and yet he's not willing to be honest, do not waste your money. Don't go to counseling. 
So it's not the counselor's fault. The counselor can't tell if someone's telling the truth or not. At you know, at least at first they can't. So they're going to be neutral in a marriage counseling situation. And you're saying something, and he's saying something completely different. So the only one that knows he's really lying is him and you. And so I think you're, if you feel safe enough to say this to him, I think I would say to him, I'm not going back. And if he says, why not say, because you're really not willing to do the work. You were totally dishonest in the whole session. And I didn't want to out you there. That's not my place. But I see clearly you're really not really willing to do the work of being honest. And so therefore we can't repair our relationship. So where do we go from here? Right? So here's where you have to be strong enough to say, I'm not living with a liar. And I'm not living with this problem. So if you're not really willing to get help with it, now where do we go? What do we do? And, and I think you have to begin to get strong enough to decide whether or not you're going to live with it. Because he's really telling you, I'm not willing to do the work right now. Mm -hmm. I can pretend and I can go there and I'll go there. And I'm going to lie through my teeth and I'm not really going to get any help. And the counselor's not going to be able to help you. And so don't waste your time and do not waste your money. The, the best thing for you to do is just call them out on it, not in a, you lied through the whole session. What's wrong with that? That kind of place, but from a place of strength and dignity, hey, I'm not going back. Why not? Because I observed that we can't possibly get any help if you aren't able to be truthful and you weren't truthful in the session. And just leave it at that. Let it sit with him that I'm not lying and pretending. I'm not, I'm not colluding with this game. Either we're really going to fix this or we're not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where your strength, women, have to has to come from. And that's why I, I do the work I do is to help prepare you to get strong enough to have those conversations, because I have to be really honest with you. Those are the only conversations that are going to wake your husband up, or at least have any potential to wake him up to say, oh, my gosh, she's not putting up with this. She's not going to let me play my game anymore. Well, then what am I going to do? Am I going to continue the game? Or am I going to start to really start to change because I'm going to lose everything if I don't. But you can't play that game. You can't do it and not do it. You got to do it. You got to be able to be strong enough to say, I yeah. am not going to partner with someone I can't trust. Yeah. Not doing it. Not living like that. And so what do you think you need in order to get strong enough to be able to do that? What do you need to build your wings to be able to strong enough to say, Hey, if I'm living with a liar, I can't have a good marriage. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's good. So good. Mm. I have I have a mother, I have a mother of my grandchildren living in the home. And she is fabricating things about my persona. She tells the children bad things about me. She also tells the father, my son, terrible things. <clears throat> is she got dementia or is she, you know, is there something wrong with her mind or something wrong with her that she's living with you would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing is when anybody ever has a negative thing to say about you to your children, especially a relative like your mother, his mother, him, it's really important that you defend yourself in a good way. So you defend yourself by saying, hey, I overheard grandma telling you this that I'm a mean mom because I won't let you, because I make you go to Christian school or whatever she's, I'm a mean mom because you know I am strict with you doing your homework. Or I won't let you have a cell phone or whatever she's saying about you, right? Or I'm a mean mom because I won't let your dad move home. Or I'm a mean mom because, or I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bad Christian because I won't forgive dad and let him move home. Whatever it is that you know that you, your kid has been told. I just need to tell you that that's not true that I am more than willing to work with your father, but I'm not willing to continue to live like this anymore. Or I am not willing to work with your dad anymore, not because I'm a bad Christian, but because he really won't be honest. Or I'm not willing to continue to do that, or I'm not stealing all the money. I don't have the power to steal all of his money. Judges decide those decisions. So you're going to give your children as much information or as little information as they may need to kind of know that this isn't true, without having to give them all the details. They don't need to know all the details. And you really don't want to disparage the other person like grandma's out of her mind or dad is lying to you. Just no, that's not really how it is. This is how it is. And then your kid is ultimately going to have to decide, especially if they're older, who they're going to choose to believe. But it's really important that you correct that misperception because by your silence, it's almost like you're saying, oh yeah, I'm guilty. And you really don't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it causes alienation. So what kind of questions do you have about how do you get strong enough or how do you live with a liar, at least temporarily, until you get strong enough? If you want to ask a question anonymously, you don't want your name on your Facebook page, you can do that through going to leslievernick.com forward slash question forward slash. We've made a little way for you to ask a question on my public Facebook page, but not be identified. So you can just type it into that uh, link. And then my assistant is watching and she will put it on my computer for me that I can answer that question. Yeah. So we're here to answer your questions. We've talked about how damaging it is to live with a liar, to be in a relationship with a liar, how it's not possible to repair a relationship with a liar who's not really willing to tell the truth and be open about that so that you can rebuild broken trust, right? And so what do you do then if you're married to someone like that? What are your options? And I'm gonna be talking about that tomorrow on a Facebook Live too. What are your options here? Because sometimes we feel really trapped, like we have no options. And you do have options. And I just want you to be clear on seeing them. You don't like them all. <laughs> we don't always like all of our options. I have a friend who's going through, um, she's got melanoma of her head and she just had surgery and had half of her skull cut, cut off and all of her hair off. And you know, she's got to go through radiation. She didn't like that option, but the other option was dying. So this or death, this or death. So sometimes you don't like your options, but you have them. Yep. And you need to pick one, right? because that's the one that produces the possibility of a longer life. That's true. It's when they say, choose your hard. <laughs> choose your hard. It's hard and harder and choose your hard. Right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are lots of questions coming in. Okay, question. How is it even possible for a 76 year old man with major hearing issues, ADHD, stubbornness and pride to even get a clue? <laughs> He wants things better, I believe, but he has no idea about self-awareness, growth, et cetera. What are simple resources that he can grasp? We are separated because we keep doing the same dance. It is awful. If a man has enough energy to argue, he has enough energy to change. He doesn't want to take the energy or the time, but he's running out of time and I am tired. So what would you say, Jim? Oh, my heart goes out to you because I understand that. And really, he has to want to change. And I agree with you when when you said that if he's got the energy to argue, he probably has the energy to change. And he's revealing to you what's important to him. He'd rather put that energy into arguing than to mm -hmm. reconciling or making any sort of peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I don't know what your position is of you know your abilities and your strengths, because I'm you know, in the seventh decade now too. And I would think oh, it's, it's exhausting. And so what do you do? How do you manage that? So I don't know what your age is or your strength, but maybe the boundaries are that you don't try to have an honest, trusting relationship. You just try to have a more peaceful coexistence and do things that protect your finances as best you can, if that's where the area of deceit is coming from. And if it's coming from other areas, there might be other boundaries. So it might be, hey, I, I don't I don't want to argue with you anymore. So what do we need to do to live together peaceably? Or, and then he can say, well, you need to sleep in the bed with me. You need to be willing to have oral sex with me. You need to, you know, he might do all those things that you're not going to talk about here. And you can say, not going to do it. <laughs> not going to happen with the quality of relationship that we have. So he's got all the energy for all the things he wants, but he's not willing to have the kind of quality of relationship to help you trust him and feel safe with him. And so I think the question becomes not what does he need to change, but what do you need right here, right now to live out your days in a peaceful, safe way? And can you do it with this man or maybe not? And if you can't do it with this man, then what do you need to do to get some wings to be able to do it by yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. very good. Because you, you know, I don't know about you, but as I'm getting older, every single day, I write a gratitude list of what I'm grateful for. Most days I put my strength and my health because I know my time is limited. I just had a good friend who passed away very suddenly. 
you know, at this age, it can happen. Now, my dad's 93 something and 20 more years. I don't know if I want another 20 more years, but it's, you know, you just think about those things at this age. And so I, my heart goes out to you too. And I would just say to you, girlfriend, you're, you don't have a whole lot of time left, but make the time you have left precious, make it meaningful, make it a place that you feel peace and uh, calm instead of anxious and arguing all the time. That's the last thing that you want to do at this age. And so what is it that you need in order to create that? And it might be a separate apartment. Yes. You know, and I'm, I'm going to bring this up. I don't have proof of what that was going on. Um, but I'm just going to tell you a little Bible trivia that most people don't know. At the time of Sarah, Abraham and Sarah's death, you know, Abraham and Sarah were married a long time and she had a child late in life. And then her husband was going to sacrifice Isaac at the altar. And I think at that moment, Sarah had enough. Um, and she was not living with Abraham at the time of her death. <laughs> she was living in a completely different town somewhere else. Um, and so there was a moment of whatever in their marriage where she said, I can't do it. And I need some peace. And so she lived by herself until or with her female relatives or whatever until her death. And it says Abraham went to where she was when she died and mourned over her. But they were not living together. And so um, I think it's OK if at this age we say, I just need some peace and some joy and some calm in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, when I think of it too, when even if it's that energy that's coming at us, it can drain us of our energy. And I don't, I mean, easy for me to say, maybe because, well, I'm in my 50s now, but I, I don't care what age we are. I'm here to serve the Lord mm -hmm. first and foremost. And so, and yes, I have to serve, you know, I serve my clients, I serve my family, I, I do, and I love that. Um, but whatever energy I have, I really want it to be for the kingdom. And so if a toxic, um, deceitful type of relationship is sucking that out of me, I want to do everything I can to plug those holes. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I want to be able, whatever time I've got left on this earth, because I could walk out right now and get hit by a bus. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I want to make sure that, because all I have is right now, and I want to make sure my now is everything that I could, could possibly make it. So that's what I pray for everybody that's here, no matter what stage of life we're in. But absolutely, I mean, without him wanting to change, I think the only person that can change is us. Yeah, and, you know, in the Bible, it talks about the importance of living in peace. And, you know, it says in Romans, for example, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. But it's not only dependent on you. So if you live with a contentious, arguing, deceitful people, person, you can't be at peace inside. It's just not possible. And in 1 Corinthians 7, where it talks about separation, he says, um, let's see. Where is it? We'll talk, Jen. I'm not sure I can find it right away. <laughs> Oh, here, it is. here it is. So he's talking about separation. He goes, um, and then he goes, I'll speak to the rest of you, though I don't have a direct command for the, from the Lord. If a fellow believer has a wife who's not a believer and she's willing to continue to live with him, he shouldn't leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who's not a believer and he's willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children will not be holy, but now they're holy. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer or isn't acting like a believer, who says he is, but isn't showing any fruit, mm -hmm. insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. God has called you to live in peace, not in constant turmoil and conflict with an angry, contentious person. And I think that's, you know, Proverbs is full of it's better to live on the corner of a rooftop than with an angry, contentious person. Living in constant turmoil, uh, constant deceit affects your immune system. It affects your health. It affects your mental health and spiritual health. And I don't think God's calling you to ask, sacrifice yourself in order to enable someone else to stay wicked and deceitful and immature and selfish. I just don't believe that that's a good stewardship of you. No, we know who that is the work of <laughs> and the <laughs> ultimate where the, where the lies are born, right? Through the enemy. So, um, no, I, I 
agree. It, it's very toxic. It makes us all sick. So we have to do whatever we can to plug those holes and not let that energy get drained out of us so that we can serve what we have left for our own peace of mind, peace mm -hmm. of heart. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen the question. Some of you have signed up for the workshop. I would really encourage you to attend live. The workshop will be twice live. It'll be at 7.30 p.m., just like now, uh, on April 13th, as well as noon Eastern time. And I would give yourself about two hours because the out workshop itself will take about 50, 55 minutes. And then afterwards, I will stay and answer your questions on our private workshop link. And so you don't have to worry about being in the Facebook page. Nobody else is going to see your question, but me and the people who are there with us. And you're going to get two benefits about being live. One is you're going to get a sense of community, just like we do here when you're on Facebook, but it's not quite the same because people are a nervous about saying where they're at or what they're doing and what's happening in their home as much as they might on a page where they're private. And so you're going to realize, oh my gosh, I am not alone. I am not crazy. I'm not the only woman who's experiencing that. And that kind of feels reassuring that I have a community of women who are in this and will help me get through this. And the second thing you're going to experience is you're going to get the Q&A time, which will not be in the replay, which will not be in the recording. So once you get the replay, it'll be an abbreviated example of the workshop, but it won't have any of the Q&A time, it won't have the chat, because we want that to be private and not available to anybody who just didn't show up. And so show up and give yourself that gift. It's absolutely free. You don't have to pay a thing, but you will get so much value. I think it could save you four or five months of counseling to get this information. And it will help you to know whether your counseling is on the right track. Because a lot of counseling, I did marriage counseling for 40 years. I learned there's all mistakes I've made, that this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this is the wrong strategies. And so I will show you the roadmap that you need to take if trust is going to be rebuilt. And here's where you have to be truthful with yourself. If trust isn't being rebuilt, and it can't be rebuilt because the other person isn't willing to do the work. Now what? What are your next steps? And that's where you probably need a lot of extra support on how you're going to handle this, both internally so that you don't have a breakdown or you don't blow up and retaliate with evil of your own, and also externally. What do you do? How do you get your wings strong enough to be able to handle the possibility of divorce or the possibility of having to live in a marriage that's not trustworthy? How do you do that for a season until you do get strong enough to make other decisions? Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about that as well at the workshop. All right, let me just answer some questions. I just signed up for the workshop. My question is, I'm about to start my divorce paperwork. Do you think this workshop will help me feel peace when it comes to my divorce? Mm -hmm. My mind is filled with guilt. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it'll help you. I, I think it'll help you see the I don't know your situation, but if you're divorcing for good reasons, um, then I think it'll give you peace. If you're divorcing for trivial reasons, it probably won't give you peace. So I'm just going to trust that you're not divorcing for trivial reasons. Like, I'm just not happy. I think I married the wrong person. Those aren't uh, the reasons that we should get divorced. Um, marriage is sacred before the Lord. And we need to honor our commitments to that. And not every season in marriage is fun and happy. It's hard work. But if two people are willing to do the work, I think a lot of marriages can be long-term marriages. However, it is my experience that a lot of times two people aren't willing to do the work. Only one person is willing to do the work and you cannot make a bad marriage into a good marriage all by yourself. You can make a bad marriage a better marriage if you don't retaliate, if you don't keep arguing and stirring up the pot yourself, but you can't make a good relationship safe and trusting by yourself. It's just not possible. And so if that's your situation and you're getting a divorce for those reasons, I think the, the webinar and the workshop will help you understand the reasons why it broke down and the reasons why it wasn't able to be repaired. And that may give you a lot of comfort and peace and also some words to use to help you to explain that to your children or to others who criticize you for your decision. All right. Um, how about you answer this one, Jen? I've heard that my soon-to-be ex-husband has called relatives and friends to say I am unstable and that he has done nothing to cause the breakup of our marriage. These people are not close to me and I've had no recent contact with any of them. I have not told anyone other than my immediate family of the circumstances that led to divorce. Do I owe anyone he's called an explanation? Hmm. That sounds like a difficult situation for sure. Um, 
I think I would do a check in my spirit first too to see because as Leslie said earlier, you want to be careful about how you defend yourself. And it depends on who these people are in in relation to your life, um, how active they may be or how influential. I mean, because if there's slander or defamation, that's just a horrible, evil thing for sure. And you do have the right to stand up for yourself. So I think you would just be very careful and, and share it as Leslie suggested earlier in a way that doesn't um, disparage anybody else as you're doing it and be able to stand up for yourself as best you can in a non-defensive way. It's just, it's very difficult to be in that situation. And I think the truth is that people lied about Jesus. You know, they told people he was a idiot. He was out of his mind. He was demon possessed. And I think Jesus didn't waste a lot of time defending himself. He said, this is who I am. I know who I am. I feel confident in my decisions and who I am. Um, and not everybody will agree with that. And if you read the book of Proverbs, it talks a lot about people who maliciously lie about other people. Um, they're called wicked people, and they do do that pretty often. And if you're married to that kind of man, it's very common. We see a lot of that in our conquer group where, um, you know, a woman will finally decide, hey, I've had enough. And all of a sudden she becomes the evil, you know, unchristian, unforgiving, you know, woman who has not, you know, extended grace and forgiveness to her seemingly repentant husband. Um, and, you know, if these people have not shown concern and care for you as a person, probably you're going to waste your time and your breath. And so you have to really think through how much energy you want to do all that. Um, but with your children, for sure, you're going to do that with. So people that you have a relationship with, you might say, you know, what he said is not true. And if you want to know more, you can let me know. And they can decide what they want to do. But with people that you don't have a relationship with, I might not be interested in wasting my energy because probably they're not going to believe you anyway. And they're going to attack you. And it's just going to be very draining and hard for you to experience that. So I might decline uh, and just trust God for my reputation and not worry about what they think about me. That's right. Yes. And pray that that the Lord will seek that revenge on our behalf for sure when um, for the truth to come out. Yeah. Um, Joanne, you have a question about Mark chapter 10 verses 11 and 12. And that's about divorce, what Jesus has to say about divorce. We covered that in our Facebook live on Monday. So if you want to um, go back and look at the recording, the Facebook lives, the past Facebook lives are on the Facebook page. You can usually get a hold of that. If you can't find it, contact our administrative staff at assistant at leslievernick.com and they'll help you get that recording to the Monday Facebook live. Because I explained it and I teased it out a lot about the context of who he was talking to and what he was saying. And I think it'll really help explain that to you. Okay, so I'm not going to take the time again today to do the same thing, but it is in the Monday Facebook live um, recording. And so just go back and watch that one and that will help you. All right. All right. Um, let's see. All right. I moved out three months ago and went to counseling for the first time this week with him. Oh, I already answered that one. Okay. Yep. When my husband sees someone who he perceives has more money than him, he finds a way to have them pay what he doesn't want to. For example, when paying the dinner tab, he gets up and pretends he's using the restroom or ghosts himself when splitting vacation costs. Most of the time, I don't know this until these people tell me. They don't tell him because he's Mr. Nice Guy. He doesn't think this is a bad thing, like he gets away with it. The lying and deceit put a dagger in our marriage. So I don't see you asking a question, but my question to you would be, have you shared your observations about this? Have you shared your feelings about this and how it impacts you and your sense of who he is as a man? Mm -hmm. Right? Because here's, here's, I think, the truth about your role as a wife. So if we're to be our husband's helpmate, which I believe that's biblically correct, just like they're to be our partner, we're to be their partner. And so we're to look out for their good, right? What is good for them? For him to act this way um, is immature at best and manipulative and sneaky and selfish at worst. So I wouldn't necessarily use those terms, but I might have a conversation like this. I might say, 
you know, I need to talk to some, I, I talked to, to you about something that I observe in your life and I'm curious about it. And is, you know, is this a good time? So I would kind of make sure he's open to a conversation. I would say, you know, I noticed that when we go on vacation, when we go out to dinner, you avoid paying the tab uh, and you do this in lots of clever ways. You go to the bathroom, you, whatever he does, I would say that. Um, and you're sort of proud of yourself that you got away with, you know, getting a free dinner or getting a free vacation. And I'm, I'm really perplexed about that because it feels kind of like you assume that you're entitled for people to pay for us just because they have more money than us and that you don't share the bill. And I, I, it makes me feel really uncomfortable watching you do that. Help me to understand why you're doing that or what that's about and see what he says. And when you ask your husband these kind of curious questions, you're not asking him actually to, you're asking him for the reason of what we talked about earlier today. One of the signs of a mature person is they have the ability to be self-aware and self-reflective because nobody's perfect, right? So they have the ability to look at themselves and say, wow, I didn't handle that very well. I need to self-correct, right? I need to make an amends. I need to make an apology. I need to change my ways. That's what repentance is all about. Children can't repent because they don't have the ability to self-reflect. But as they mature, they do have the ability to self-reflect and look at themselves and their conscience should speak to them and all those kind of things. So as you ask your husband these questions as his helpmate, he should have the opportunity to self-reflect and say, well, you know, why wouldn't I do that? They have more money than me and to say, but yeah, but that's not really fair to just feel entitled to them paying our way. And that makes me feel icky inside. How does it make you feel? And give him a chance to reflect on that. Now he may not, but that gives you information as to his willingness to receive your feedback to help him be a better man. When my husband gives me feedback and he's given me some hard feedback at times. Like, I think you're getting a little full of yourself would be one of the feedback he gave me at one time early in my career. Um, and he was right. I was thinking, oh, everybody wants to hear me. And that was, that was not a person I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a proud, arrogant, look at me kind of person. And it was good that he gave me those hard words so that I could reflect and self-correct, right? And then develop humility and a servant's attitude, not a proud attitude of look at how God's using me, right? Or if he gives me a tic tac when I'm <laughs> talking to someone, he's doing it to help me so that I don't have bad breath all over somebody. So, so we're there to have each other's back and to encourage each other. If you don't have the ability to speak truth into your husband's life or he refuses to hear you, then understand the Bible tells you he's functioning as a fool, a foolish man, and he will end up paying the consequences as will you if you keep putting yourself under his leadership. And so I think our job as a good wife isn't to enable that dysfunction. It's to challenge it. It's to say, that's not cool. That doesn't make you very attractive. The same as you would if your husband had big, you know, pieces of chocolate in his teeth or something. You'd say, your, your teeth are all messed up. Go brush them. It doesn't make you look very attractive right now, right? Or if he had a big smudge on his face or he smelled terrible. I mean, you're not loving saying those things, but you're loving him by telling him the truth so that he can self-correct. You don't correct him. You don't say, here, let me give you a bath, you stink. But you might say, I think you need a bath, right? Because you're not smelling so good and I don't wanna kiss you right now. And that's hopefully feedback that he will take in and say, wow, I didn't even notice I was smelling so bad. I need to, thank you, thank you, right? That's what people do for one another in a healthy relationship, mm -hmm. thank you. I didn't see the mole on the back of my head. Oh my gosh, I better go to the doctor. I thank you for having eyes to see things in my life that I didn't see. The Bible tells us that in Hebrews 3.13, let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So I would encourage you to have one of those conversations with your husband and give him honest feedback on how that makes you feel and how that's not very attractive to you and see whether he can come up with some self-reflection and maybe some repentance. All right. Jen, I'm gonna give you this question. I have made a personal decision to stay in, this stay in this relationship due to kids' safety and parenthood. I anticipated not wanting to dispute in court or expose kids to a separate households for their safety. I have several boundaries in place, 
financially separate accounts, informed decisions, completely no emotional intimacy. Three years ago, I drew the line in the sand and he agreed to get counseling. He's been in counseling every week since. I am completely detached from this relationship. I accepted and understood more about his sexual addiction and I'm not enabling him anymore. His gaslighting, dishonesty. I'm working really hard to be financially independent. In seven years, my kids are graduating and that is time for our separation. I feel like I have a missing puzzle on how to be strong to face my kids and even my aging parents. These are the people that will be impacted by my decision. How can I become stronger in these years? I have a therapist and I read books and reflect a lot. How can I prepare my kids for this eventual moment? Hmm. I think it sounds like you're already doing that by just by living it by I think by example and doing all the things that you've already talked about. I mean, just going back up because it switched pages. But I mean, you, becoming financially independent and all of those things. And, and I can only imagine just the relational context with your children on a day to day basis where you've had to be very strong and confident in your relationships with them, I think is actually showing a lot of that strength. Um, but as far as what does this say, the missing puzzle on how, or how to be strong to face my kids or even my aging parents. So if there's something there that you're feeling that you owe to them maybe, or something like that, then I would, I would pray about that and, and consider what it is that you think that you owe them. This is your decision. This is for your safety. This is for your sanity and probably for the betterment of everyone that's involved. If, um, especially if he's not, um, being repentant or in any sort of healing program for himself. So that would be something to consider um, before you actually have to go and actually make any sort of statement to them. But I really think that you've been living it out on a day-to-day -day basis already. Yeah, I think you have too, and you don't know the future. And so I wouldn't get anxious about that. I mean, I think it's tempting to get anxious about the future, um, but you really don't know. And so you say your husband's been in counseling every week for three yeah. years. And so have you seen any movement, any change, any less gaslighting, any more honesty, any more self-awareness and self-reflection? So when we think about the stepping stones to maturity, you know, self-awareness, oh, I'm aware that I'm angry. Oh, I'm aware that I'm tempted to lie. Oh, I'm aware that I'm in a tempting situation to cheat or whatever it is. And then Am I reflecting like, why am I keep coming to the same old place? Why do I keep turning onto these internet sites? Why am I, why am I doing what I'm doing? And then self-correction. I need to create a different plan. I need to do something different. I need to grow up. I need to take more responsibility, whatever it is, that self-reflection and the repentance of self change, you know, changing my ways. Are you seeing any of that forward movement? And that doesn't mean that your marriage is going to be reconciled, but those might mean some things of saying, you know, I'm so glad that I put my foot down because he is becoming a better dad and he is becoming a better man. Whether or not I can ever trust him again as a husband might be completely out of your wheelhouse to even imagine. But right now, is you, do you see him being a better man, a better husband? That would be the question. I think what I'm hearing you anticipate is criticism mm. and shaming when you finally come to the decision at the end of these seven years or at the end of your children's childhood that you're done. And all of a sudden it's like, well, you put up with it so long. Why would you break up your family now? What's wrong with you that you just can't keep doing what you've always done and keep your family together and all of those kind of things. And you probably will. You probably will get some criticism. And so I would just encourage you to do two things. One is just continue to walk with the Lord and ask him each you know, as you're saying, show me the way that I should go today, Lord, show me the way I should go today and follow that. And so at the end of the day, if your decision is the same as it is now, in the time that your kids are grown, I think you can say, you know, our marriage ended a long time ago. And I, your, your dad broke my trust. And I am so glad that he's working on himself. And I'm so glad that he's changed and working on himself to be a better man. But we have not done any work to rebuild our relationship. Both of us have been very committed to being good parents. And I think him doing his work has given him the energy and the insight to be a better dad. And I'm so grateful for that because I couldn't have left because I was scared for your safety back then. And so I stayed for your safety. And I'm glad that you had a great childhood and you were safe and you are launched. And now it's time for me to feel like I can be safe too in a apartment of my own without having to be anxious about what he's going to do or how he's going to slip up or what he might tell me or not tell me. 
If he changed, great. That's great. I'm happy for him. But I don't think I'll ever trust him again. And that would be sort of the script that you would say, because sometimes consequences, and I think this is, again, if we're going to live in the truth, ladies, the Bible never minimizes that consequences can sometimes be permanent. Like when David raped Bathsheba and she got pregnant and the child died and David was repentant. Once Nathan confronted him, he was repentant. I am that man. I am that man who abused my power and took something I shouldn't take. And the child died. The child still died. God didn't say, oh, well, now that you're repentant, I won't allow the child to die. The child still died. And so some consequences are permanent. If you drink and drive and you go home and you kill a kid on a bike, you might be genuinely repentant. You may never drink again. You may go to AA the rest of your life, and I hope you do. But that child is permanently dead. They're not going to be resurrected because you're sorry. And so I think we have to face the reality that sometimes sin is grievous and it has permanent consequences. If you molest my child, I hope you're repentant, but you are never going to be in my child's presence alone again, ever. Right. And so sometimes trust is permanently broken. And if that's you, I don't think you need to feel guilty about that. I think you can just be honest that I don't think I can ever trust your dad again. And I hope he's become a trustworthy man. But I don't want to live with someone I'm anxious with. And I would always feel anxious with him. And I don't want to do that anymore. And some people will be okay with that. And some people won't. And that's where you have to be okay with them not being okay with you. Mm -hmm. All right, a couple more. We have a about 25, so we've been an hour. We're going to go. We have a hard stop at, uh, I'm getting mixed up because I'm on Pacific time. All right, so it's almost, we're going to have a hard stop at eight. Is that what we're having? Nine. Hard stop at nine. Okay, yeah. so about 25 more minutes. More minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My husband, uh, we've been married 26 years, was unfaithful for five years before he filed for divorce. I still don't feel at peace now that it's final. How can I find peace? I still feel like I should be standing for my marriage. So what do you think you need to find some closure and peace? Right? Because I just read to you in 1 Corinthians where it says, if they don't want to be married, let them go and live at peace. So what is it that you're not at peace about, right? So I think this is part of accepting that you can't control everything. And although you wished it would have been different, it isn't. This is reality. Your husband divorced you. It's been a while. So what's, what's your blockage in accepting that reality and being at peace? That he made a decision and I have to live with that consequence. And for me to live in standing for a marriage that I don't even married anymore, is sort of living in falsehood, right? So I think we've had some wrong Christian teaching that we've got to have some magical thinking about, you know, restoration and reconciliation. He's moved on. He's done. He's closed that chapter. So what would what stops you from closing that chapter and saying, I honored my vows and I can't control him. I can only control me. And I'm going to live at peace. I'm going to trust God for peace here. What stops you from that? And if you want to, Put that in the chat. Maybe we can interact a little bit more. But I think that's something that you have. You have a, I think a, a miss, a wrong belief about your standing before the Lord. That somehow you have to stay married when reality says you've been divorced. You've been divorced. Accept it and live at peace. The Bible says if they don't want to be with you, let them go and live in peace. Can you do that? Any thoughts, Jen? No, I, I just, my heart, my, my heart is very full with, with all of these circumstances tonight. And I agree with you, Leslie. I think it's something that we have to ask ourselves, what's holding me back from finding my own peace? Is it, it could even be a pride issue that I didn't want to be divorced. It could still be residual um, and understandable, but residual contempt towards the situation because I think you said he was unfaithful for five years beforehand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of unjust things have happened. Absolutely. All the things that would would cause that lack of peace. But 
the results are still it's ended up in divorce that you can be free now in the sense that you can move on with your life. And so for that, I agree with Leslie is to find out what's standing in the way between you and your peace. And if there's any biblical grounds for divorce, adultery is definitely one of them. So what is it about this that you're having a hard time saying goodbye and letting go? Yeah. Yep. Right. All right. I feel bad potentially removing my children's father due to his drinking since he's really not around when he drinks. He goes out so they don't see it, but they are aware of the lying and have been affected by it. And now there is a DUI, which they see but I'm not sure that's enough to say this is done. Yeah, any thoughts, Jen? I think, well, again, we're talking about consequences, right? And so uh, they talk about, I think any addiction, but they do say this specifically with alcoholism is a family disease. And so whenever we think the kids don't know something, they know. They know way more than you think, more than you give them credit for. And so even though they may not have actually observed him drinking, now you're saying that they know about the lying, they know the DUI, they all of that, the dynamics that go on, probably the, the arguments that maybe you've had because he's been home late or stumbled in or maybe some damages that have been caused by anything that he's been doing while he was drunk. So I can appreciate that it's it's hard about the thought, but I would I would then sit with that and think about what it is that you're afraid of. And because when you're talking about the potential removal of the you're seeing the child's father around when he drinks. So I'm not sure if you're actually talking about separation or just making sure that they don't see him drinking. But if it's enough to say that you're done in terms of divorce, then I think it's something you just have to really understand about what's at stake here, because there could be a lot of safety issues, especially when there's a DUI. It's there's one thing when it's pride because it's public and I get that, but there could be very much a safety issue here that the police got involved. So that's what would be worrying me and the example that we want to set with for our kids as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think having a conversation with yourself and maybe with some wise others, um, um, divorce is not a mandatory thing to do for adultery or any sin. So I think having a conversation with your husband and saying, you know, drinking seems to be the most important thing in your life, more important than being a dad, more important than being a husband, more important than being a believer, more important than anything. Um, and that's impacting my ability to trust you, my ability to feel safe with you. And, you know, where do we go from here? I think having, you know, being proactive and having these conversations that let them know that their behavior is affecting you and affecting the kids. And he still may choose that. And then you have to decide what is the impact of his choices and his drinking on us? And so is it how damaging is it damaging? What do I see as the effects of this on our children, on my children, on me, on our health, on our safety? And it's not the same for everybody. So it's not the same answer for everybody in different seasons of life. It might be different if your children are older or they're younger or they drive with them or they don't drive with them. You know, so I, I we can't give you an answer. Um but we do want to say that not every situation is a deal breaker. We all live with imperfect people and we're not getting divorced for, you know, because I don't like what you're doing right now or what you're doing is bugging me right now. Um, we're, so here's where the, the temptation is. We're called to develop two disciplines in our life. And sometimes some of us have too much people pleasing and accommodating and forbearance, the biblical term would be for it. We just accept and put up with people's flaws. And the Bible tells us that we're to do that. We're to accept and understand that everybody is a mess and we live with imperfect people and go to church with imperfect people and we're imperfect people. Our children are imperfect people. And to live in a family, you're going to have to deal with stress and uncomfortableness at times and learn how to deal with it wisely right? Develop strength because of it, develop emotional resilience and health and help them develop it too, because you're not going to live with perfect people. So that's one quality that we're to develop as we mature. And then the other quality that we're to develop when we mature is wisdom to know when we're not to put up with it, right? When is the wisdom to say, no, this is not acceptable. This is a deal breaker. This fractures relationships and deceit is to me, one of those things. It's not just adultery. I mean, with adultery, you get deceit, but chronic deceit in a relationship is not something that you just, oh, well, you know, he lies every day. No, you can't have a relationship that's safe and trusting with someone who lies to you. So then what? 
What's your next step? How do you deal with that? And that's your growth to manage. And how do I speak the truth in love? And how do I have consequences? And what boundaries do I set? And these are all things that God is going to give you as an opportunity to learn and grow into a stronger, better, more resilient, wiser woman. Um, and so do your work. It's not just about getting divorced and getting away from the bad guy. It's doing your work to do it in a wise, strong, competent way, unless you're in danger and then get out and do your work afterwards. But you have some work to do. And I think this is where we've been naive as women. Sometimes we think, oh, I just married the wrong person. I need to get rid of him and find the right person and then I'll be fine. But we don't realize that we have to become the right person in order to find the right person. Somebody in the chat was saying, you know, I've already been married twice and divorced twice. I don't want to make another mistake. And you're right. And so I would encourage you to do your work so that you have that wisdom to see someone who they really are and what's something I can live with because I'm not going to change that person. And what are things I can't live with? And how do I know myself well enough to know that? And how do I get to know someone else in a dating relationship well enough to know who they really are and how they really show up and how do I pay attention? And those are all parts of your growth and maturity so that it's not just a, a man that you're looking at, but even your girlfriends. You know, when I play pickleball and I play with a bunch of people, I can kind of see who would make a good girlfriend and who wouldn't make a good girlfriend? Who do I want to hang out with? And who do I not want to hang out with? Just by the way they treat people, the way they talk on the side, the gossip that they say, all those kind of things give me information about who they are and what's important to them, right? And so I think those are things that you need to um, notice and practice, even when you're not dating, to pay attention to who are you drawn to and who are you repelled by. And that, and it's not just sinful things, it's just personality. Mm -hmm. All right. I have been listening to your blame game. My question is, how do you deal with someone that accuses you of just wanting to blame them when you're not actually trying to do that at all and that you're twisting things around to be on them when you're trying to explain how you see things while taking responsibility for your actions? I am dealing with a person who feels I am putting them down if I ask for anything different than them, what they want or asking them to be doing something differently. I then am not allowed to try and explain what I meant. That was not to offend them or make them feel that way. And then I get the silent treatment and withdrawal. Or I ask that they pick something up that they have dropped on the floor. Not saying anything nasty, just asking if they can do this. I only usually ask for something to be done differently if I have a good reason for it to be done differently, such as putting a cover on the dish in the microwave so it doesn't splatter all over the microwave because it's hard to clean. So I need better ways to reply when the situation becomes what I am getting at, that I do not want to talk about anything other than things outside of the home. Wait a minute. So I need better ways to reply when the issue becomes what I am getting that I do not want to talk about. Anything other than things outside the home, nothing in the relationship wise. I always approach it wrong. Would love your advice. Well, wow, that sounds a lot like um, darned if you do, darned if you don't. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're set up that no matter how you describe it, explain it, we call it jading, <laughs> right? Don't justify, argue, defend, or explain. But when you fall into that trap because they're inviting you in or you feel the need to, and then and then they take that and spin it. And, you know, and then basically what they're trying to do is deflect it. It reminds me of, um, oh, Leslie, you remember those, what are they, the fun houses? When you go in and the mirrors are all over the place, that deflection, that's what this sounds like to me. It reminds me of, you started off on one conversation. I'm simply asking you not to splatter everything all over the microwave. And then it becomes, well, you always yell at me. Well, I don't always yell at you. I, there's, I'm just simply asking you, well, remember that time that you, and all of a sudden it's the mirrors all over the fun house and they just do that it's like a trap that they've like a vortex that they've sucked you into to just be able to shift the blame back on you i truly in those situations i'm sorry i don't think there's any way out other than to not be silent so much but just say i see things differently and just that's it because they're trying to rope you into something on purpose it's very intentional 
It is very intentional. And um, it's, it's, it's very intentional to try to get you into the crazy dance so that finally you're so exasperated, you aren't making sense and you are emotionally fried. And then he can say, and you call yourself a Christian? Look what you just called me. Because you finally say, jerk, stop it, <laughs> whatever. And you allow yourself to get so worn out and so frazzled that you're at your wit's end. And then you might behave in ways that he can say in front of the kids, look, your mom is a lunatic. And it sort of looks like you are in the moment because he has set you up for that. So it is really, really important that you do two things. One is you don't engage in those kind of conversations. There is no conversation to be had here. So keep your request simple. Could you please put a top on the microwave? And if you don't, could you please clean out the mess? Period, right? And no, whoa, you always are criticizing me. I would just not respond. Could you just please put a top on the microwave? I would just repeat the same mm -hmm question all right so and if he chooses not to then i'm trusting that you'll just clean up your mess if you don't choose to want to do that all right and he may not clean up his mess just to prove his point he may not talk to you for two weeks because he wants to control you mm -hmm. and they do that as a strategy to control you to make you look nuts or to control you to make you anxious about the relationship i'm not going to talk for you, to you for two weeks so you're going to be like why aren't you talking to me why don't you come in let's talk let's have a conversation we need to talk well what, what, don't you care about our marriage and it's like you're begging him to have a relationship with you please don't demean yourself that way please don't degrade yourself that way don't let him put you in that position so the place where you need to do your own work is to see what's happening and to get strong enough to detach like, I don't need him to understand in order for me to be okay. I don't need him to do what I want him to do in order for me to handle myself in a good way. Because he's not going to in order to irritate you. I don't need him. And this is the final one. I don't need him to love me like I want to be loved in order for me to be okay. That doesn't mean you don't want him to, but you don't need him to with a big old capital N-E-E-D. Because as long as you're needing him to do something for you, he's got a lot of power over you. And this is where you need to start detaching and saying, I'm going to be the person God calls me to be. I'm going to say things in the way that I feel very safe and comfortable asking. And I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to defend. I'm not going to justify. I'm not going to explain anymore because it gets into this crazy dance. And then I end up saying things I regret or I'm questioning my own sanity. So keep it simple one sentence, one request, he does it or he doesn't do it. And if you can keep it that way, that'll give you a lot of information because he either does it or doesn't do it or he punishes you for it. And that will clarify things for you, won't it? Because then you won't be saying, what did I say wrong? And why can't he understand? You understand there is a strategy here and it's to make you look horrible. Mm -hmm. And honestly, ladies, I'm just going to, we've had situations in our Conquer membership as well as I've had personal situations where the husband is so good at this that it actually does make you so crazy and upset that you do things and say things that your kids now look at you like you are the evil twin, that you are the abusive one, that you are ungodly and hateful and mean. And that's the last thing that you want to happen to yourself because then when he decides to use that against you in court or if you like I had a, a friend of mine who actually got provoked to the place where she shoved her husband. And guess what he did? He called 911 and said, I'm being abused. And she's the one who got arrested and she's the one who lost custody of her children. Yeah. Don't let yourself get to that place. Yeah. And that's where it's really important that you not have to have your husband understand in order for you to be OK, because he doesn't want to. If he wanted to, he would be asking good questions for you, but he's not. And so recognize what's happening and get some support, get some support. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see if we have one more that we can answer. Sure. My husband may be a uh, narcissistic personality disorder. So we want to be careful about diagnosing other people because um, other than me, most are not trained professionals and I haven't met your husband, so I'm not going to diagnose him. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's criteria, but we want to be careful about, uh, labeling people. Uh, you can say there are certain selfish and prideful attitudes that he has that make me wonder if that might be the case. So here's, we go, here we go. He's been hoarding cats for years. We've been married 30 years and have been through a lot. 
I became depressed over a year ago, lost my job and have been living on my savings. We keep our money separate. I have been depressed to the point of not taking care of my hygiene. I need to get another job, but have no confidence. Divorce would be difficult because he's controlling and might see, seek revenge by destroying the house. My house was given to me by my dad and is paid off. I'm 64 and due to the condition of my house because of the cats, I don't think I could get a roommate. So your question is, I'm not sure. Mm-mm. But you're aware that you need some help, right? You're aware right now you need some help. You're depressed. You've lost your job. You're not functioning well. And so it doesn't really matter what's going on with your husband right now. You need to get some help for you. And so I would just really encourage you to do that, to find, go to your doctor, talk to him about your depression. You might need some medication. Uh, get a counselor that will help you work through your depression. You might need a coach to help you job search. And when you have the energy to begin to do that or to start to rebuild your life, um, you might need to get to a financial advisor to talk about your house and whether this inherited house is joint marital property or your property. I don't know the state's laws in your land or what you've done in terms of all of that. Um, but he may have equal rights to be there because you didn't set it up in the right way when you got an inheritance. So those are all things that could be things that you do that have any nothing to do with him and his NPD or your marriage. Um, but I think right now, the first step is you can't even think clearly mm-hmm. when you're depressed. I couldn't when I was depressed. So most people don't think clearly when they're depressed. And the first step is to take care of you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Jim? No, I, I appreciate everything and all the wisdom that you've shared tonight. It's been incredible. Well, so the bottom line is, no, you can't have a relationship with a liar. And when someone continues to lie, so there was a question in the chat that I didn't see on the thing that she said her husband had taken a polygraph a number of years ago for a sexual addiction, and that was fine. But now he lied recently about a relationship with a coworker. And, you know, if you're not calling him on that to see where he's at. So if you said, hey, you didn't tell me the truth here and this is like Groundhog Day and I'm not going back there. I'm not going back to where we were. You might be, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. So I'm just letting you know, I see what you're doing and it's not okay. Then he can have a chance to decide, you know, you're right, I have this habit of, you know, kind of first response is to lie and to cover up because I don't want to have to face that I did flirt or I did have a conversation and I just wasn't brave enough to be honest. That's a start, at least, if you confront and he confesses. But if you're brooding and he's hiding, you're both going back to Groundhog Day, right? And so someone has to start the dance differently and it might be you who just says, hey, this smells familiar and we're gonna talk about this in the workshop. So please sign up for the workshop because we're gonna talk about what is old history and how will you know new history is being built. And I'm going to give you some very specific things to watch out for. And one of them is when you confront about old history, what happens? Is he recognizing that and he doesn't want to go back there either? Or is he going back and making excuses and blaming you and spinning things? So those are the ways that you'll know I'm not, I'm not going back there. He may be back there, but I'm not going back there. And that's where we talked about you've got your wings built and you can do what you need to do because the branch is breaking yeah right so we are at time and tomorrow i'm going to be off i have some other things i have to do so we're not doing a facebook live at least i don't think we are i'm not maybe somebody else is and i'm just not on the schedule maybe somebody else is doing it i don't Um, see any no not yet (laughs) okay so i think we're taking tomorrow off but friday i think friday we're going to do a facebook live on um let's see i think i have the topic yep it says my relationship is hard my heart hurts what choices do i have and we've been talking about that a lot how do i what choices do i have because when we don't like our choices like my friend who's got melanoma in her head i mean none of the choices were good Mm -mm. it was all hard harder hardest (laughs) which one of these three icky icky choices do you want to make so we want something like roses and happy and peaceful and you know bliss and we don't have that choice but it's really important that you recognize that you do have choices and you think about what you have because you have a part in authoring your story 
and how it's going to turn out, both on the external, not as much on the external, but somewhat on the external, your marriage, your, you know, where you're going to live, all those kind of things, but also what's going on inside here. You have 100% control and responsibility for what happens inside of you when you go through hard times. And I'm not saying that there aren't some hard things to go through when you're going through hard things, but you need to know how to do that and get through to the other side so that you become a more loving, sensitive, wise, strong person, not in spite of what happened to you, but actually because of what happened to you because of it. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of us can testify to horrible things that we've had to walk through that we would have not wanted to walk through, but we had to make choices in those hard things. And the choices we made made a difference in how we came out the other end. Right. And so I want to teach you what that looks like. So I will be back on Friday at noon Eastern time. And please, if you have not signed up for the workshop, we're getting a lot of people signing up now. So we want you to be a part. We want you to join in. If you know somebody who needs to be a part, this is primarily for Christian women who might think that they're in destructive marriages. Okay. The workshop is how long do you keep trying? What does that look like? And how will you know that you're just wasting your energy because you don't have a partner who's trying with you. How will you know whatever he's doing is not really going to lead to where there is safety and trust rebuilt in your marriage? It's just whitewash. And I will show you how to look for that and what to look for in that workshop. So please show up. Uh, so if you need to know that information, you have it written down for yourself so that if you're in that situation or think you might be anytime soon, you'll have wisdom and God's word to know how to make good decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you so much, Jen. I appreciate you and your wisdom. And, you. and we will um, see you on Friday. All right. Take care. God bless Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.